Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. You see, if this wasn't a program of recovery, it would mean that it's a program of failure. And that can't be. I'm coming up to 42 years in December. That's not a program of failure. I haven't drank. I've had a good life. I've had a good a, 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 a mind that amazes me, even today. Of the world it presents to me, the people that it presented to me, people that I can be a part of their life. How come? Before, I couldn't, own, I couldn't even own a dog. I'd kill it. This is serious, what I'm saying. My head is a vicious mind. It's a mind that's full of me. It's full of tomorrows. It's full of yesterdays. It's full of anger. It's full of depression. It's full of everything, and it's always going to be full of it. But I don't need to live by it. I don't have to draw from it. I don't have to relive things. I don't have to experience the same experience I had before. Why do that? It's not necessary. It's not needed. Self says it is, but God says, no, it's not. Well, I'm talking about I'm talking about application of steps in the now. Now, I had to learn myself that this means exactly that, that I do have a power right now, right now, right now, that if a thought comes to me, it doesn't have to stay. I don't have to feed into it. I don't have to give it energy. I don't have to follow through. I don't have to take it with me another foot. It doesn't, it, it, it just, I just don't have to energize it. The Sermon on the Mount was talking to Emmett Fox in there, and it talks in there about like thoughts are like soldiers. If you let them hang around, you let them out in the battlefield that dig trenches, you can't get them out. They're like thoughts. Thoughts are, are like enemy soldiers. You leave the thought in your mind, the first thing you know, there it is. It's got a hold of you, and it's entrenched in your mind. Now, how are you going to get that out? See? Well, here in Alcoholics Anonymous, we do have a method. And this method is what I'm talking about is in 4, 5, and 6. And this is about defects of character. But you see, defects of character are known defects of character in 4, 5, and 6. And then when we get to 10, we're going to go into another arena. It's entirely different. So stay in step 4, 5, and 6, knowing that no matter what's in your mind, no matter what's happening in your life, it's going to be all right. But you must build this character. You must go through an application, building a character. So that character is the character you live with. You know, it, it's true. Honestly, guys, it's true. That, that, that's a good question. Uh, and it really, it's not valid, but it's true. It's true that you do that. You know, I do it, you do it. We, maybe all of us do it at one time or another. In Alcoholics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, you don't come here and pick and choose. You don't come here and just because you disagree with something, you don't do it. See, this is a program recovery. This means exactly this. You know, in page 58, when it was read, you read there in page 58 in the big book, it says, Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. I was a will not, and I didn't know it. I wasn't a cannot. I was a will not. I just refused. Two and a half years, I said, baloney, I ain't going to do none of that. That's not needed. I'm all right. But I wasn't all right. I was going to hell. And I knew it, though, because my life kept going worse and worse all the time. I kept acquiring things, but I, my mind got worse. You see, the my very best, when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, brought me here. Not my worst. My very best brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous. I tried as hard as I could try in a world that I lived in to stay in that world, and I couldn't do it. I gave it my best shot, and I wound up in an alcoholic hospital. Then when I get to Alcoholics Anonymous and I get into program recovery, you know what I'm still trying to do? I'm still trying to do my best. I'm still trying to regulate, think this thing out, act accordingly. This is what it means. That's what it means. I'll do this. I'll do that. No, I won't. I don't have the power. But you see, in step two, step two is in the second position. Step one is identifying, accepting a disease of twofold nature, hitting bottom, and the rest of it there is the unmanageable life. But step two says differently. Step two, no matter who you are, you can make it. But you must do step two in application. You must get an open mind, quit arguing, and turn your will in your life from two and three. Now you've got a hold of something different. The steps allow you and I to change 
in application for what they're there for. That's why we keep going back to two, or I keep going to two all the time. That's when I take it back. That's when I'm the authority. That's when I talk to me. I don't talk to God. I, t I talk to God when I'm in trouble. Sure I do. But I get in trouble by not talking to him. If you don't change, you can't do anything about it. <laughs> That's the bottom line. If you don't change, if you still want to be the main man, if you want to be the source of supply, you want to play God, you want to tell yourself you're entitled to do that, keep doing it and see what happens. I ain't going to do it. I'm not going to pay that price. <clears throat> this program recovery is a program recovery. It allows me to live in the same world that I come from. But I have a new idea here. It's God's concept, not mine. This is only one world, but there's two concepts. There's mine and God's. And this means exactly that. If I still want to do the things that I want to do, I'll do them. And I've got to pay the price. But that's kind of stupid, I figured for myself. To be able to be offered a life that I couldn't duplicate, money couldn't buy it. People that are in my life, I couldn't even buy with money. And yet they're there. And they're showing me and giving me Things, love, true love. I know money don't buy that kind of love. This is important to say because this is the things that I recognize in today's life that are treasured things. Under the grace of God, he gets the credit. Nobody else does. There's, in step three, <clears throat> in step three they're talking in there about making a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. As I understood them. Now, step one, the last half of one, was talking about that my life's unmanageable. I had to look at this more than what it just says. My life is unmanageable, whether I'm drunk or sober. I found that out. I, was, I learned this in step one, but I also learned what an unmanageable life is. An unmanageable life isn't from drunkenness or anything like that. An unmanageable life is in the day I live in, whether it's this day or any day. It doesn't make no difference. An unmanageable life is a life I cannot live in this world. There's too much wrong with it. There's too much happening. There's too many adversities, too many people that are wrong. Everywhere I look, everywhere I go, I seem to run, run into something that disturbs me. You see, this here is, is something now like in, we get in step 10. It'll come out more clear in step 10. But I, gotta, I have to know exactly what this God's world is. Because for me to go into a world, like, you must tell me something. You must show me something. And that's what step three is all about. And this means exactly that, even when it says the willingness. Now, the willingness would mean that even when I fail in the day I'm in, say I fail, whatever I consider failing, it's not failing to God, it's failing to me. Because I bank on me, I go to me, I want different results, I don't get it, and I think it's wrong. I can't accept it. There's so many things on, about my life in the day I'm in that if you don't help me see something, don't let me try to figure this thing out because I can't figure it out. I get lost. I don't. I want results now, and I can't have results now, but I can have results in the day I'm in. So what goes down that day? I can live that day because my Heavenly Father is still taking care of me. No harm will come to me. I found this out way down in three, not in step seven. The, the point of this is, if I don't build a dependency upon a power greater than me, on this God, I won't have it because I'll go other places. I'll depend on people, places, or things. I'll depend on maybe money. I'll depend on maybe cars, maybe motorhomes, maybe women, maybe this, maybe that. Maybe that's where I need to go. Maybe that's why I can't live right today. Maybe that's why I don't have enough money. Maybe I got this job. Maybe I get rid of this guy or this gal. She's, the, she's my problem. No, she ain't my problem. That job ain't my problem either. My problem is my mind. I can't fit in this world, and it's a sober world. It's not a drunken world. The disease of alcoholism is ism. It means exactly that. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you how I know that I'm okay. Is that I have a quiet mind. I have a good life. There's a lot of beautiful people in, in the world I live in. It, these disappointments, failures, are not there. I don't build a great big high to be satisfied. I don't. I don't need to. I'm high as I can get with God all the time. Now, this is true. This is banking on God. This is depending on God. This is all the time using the power. 
of God in all of my affairs. Listen, I've been in some places, man, I really mean bad places to be. But I still depend on the power of God to take me through it. And I'm talking about death. I'm not talking about drunkenness. And this is true. But you see, that's my life. That's what happened to me. But as it's happening to me, I keep going for more. And the reason I go for more is because there's more to go for. The mind that I have, I think it's full. I think it's wonderful. I think I've had the best day there ever could be. I think that no day will ever top this day. And I've had many of these days. You know what happens? Another day comes and beats that one all to hell. That's only by the grace of God, not by my grace. That's because my mind doesn't go back to the sewer. My mind stays open. My mind is receptive to what's going on in the world I'm in. I can be a part of this world. I can contribute to this world. Whatever I can do, I can give something. And that makes me feel good about me. Well, you know, this, the, the, the defects of character, uh, like I said in the beginning, I had to find out just exactly what are defects of character. So I had to find out that the character that I am lives only in the day I am in. And this character, the day I'm in, has the defects there, and they can be identified. But first I have to associate what it is that I do as I think, as I live. And it could come from yesterday, so don't get this wrong. But it's in my mind today, alive today. I'm using it today. It's there today. It's the thing that I do today that gives me the unmanageable life. It's the thing that I do today that I shouldn't have done, but I do it anyway. And this means now that sometimes I don't know this. In reality, I don't know it. But because what I do, I'm so, I'm so programmed to do this. But see, the steps say, no, you're not programmed no more like that. We're changing. We're building new character. Let's find out all of the wrongs and all of the things that are in your life today. If they came from yesterday or yesteryears, put them down because it's my mind today. It's what I draw from. It's the way I think from. I reach in my mind, my file cabinet. I grab things. I take things out of there. And these things I take out of there are harmful things. They're defective. They're defects of character. Where I lived in a world, and when I use these defects, I hurt the world. I hurt me. Because it's all about this. It's all about a thinking process that controls me, and it's me. You, you know, this, this, is, this is something that I know a great deal about because I had to learn this. I had to learn and associate my life in the day I live in by things that are going on so that I have no excuse, no excuse at all for my behavior. And this is how I had to do this. And what these ominous signs are are coming from the old me. It means from the defects of character. It means from my mind how these ominous signs will show me, it'll show me some maybe guilt, resentments, maybe some fears, maybe some anger, maybe some prejudice, maybe uh, uh, impatient when I'm impatient. Uh, some, you know, sometimes I, I can't even go to a red light sometimes, and I think the red light's painted because it never turns green. I sit there and I sit there and I sit there and I think I'm sitting there five hours, you know, and I don't know. That's an ominous sign. That don't know that that's going to attack me. That's going to set me off. That's going to get me ready for the next thing that comes along that I don't like. The ominous signs are always coming from my, my character of the old, the, the, the disease of the alcoholism. Stop and think yourself how sometimes you'll tolerate something. And you'll tolerate it, tolerate it. And all of a sudden you can't tolerate it no more. The ominous sign was there the first time, but you didn't do nothing about it. And there it comes, this building now. Somebody does something once too often and you flip out. How come you flip out? Because you kept it inside. It's festering. It's staying in here. And when it stays in here, it's going to come. Just give it time because I'll display it. I'll show you who I really am. The ominous signs are, are always about the defects. It's always about the things you already know. The things that upset you, the things that bother you, the things people say and do that, that really, really are irritating things. Might be small to start, but they get big in a big hurry. It talks in here, it says, So our troubles we think are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Then it goes down farther. And what it says farther, it says, Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. This is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. 
He is the principal and we are his agents. He is the father and we are his children. Most good ideas are simple and this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant art through which we pass to freedom. Application, see, of the same thing all the time. It's talking there about a way of life, of something to do. This is done now. This ain't done and then it's passed and gone by. It's never gone by. It's never alcoholism. The change of character has to change. It has to change today. As you change today, you live it today. This is application again. Back down in step two and three. The reason step two is in building a new character in the second step, second position, is to be able to be qualified to go to three as a new character. Now, this means exactly that. It says, I came to believe in a power that's greater than me that can restore me to sanity. It's understood that there is a power that's greater than me. And this power that's greater than me isn't named in step two in this manner. But it's also laid out there to show me me all the time, me. Because for me to believe in something other than me, I must recognize that I play God. I play the role. I'm the power for my life. I regulate everything. I regulate my thoughts, my ideas, my jobs, my my association, my relationships, my everything. I do that. That comes from me. But you see, I don't know that that's the power that I live by. When I live by that power, if I don't do something, I have to stay with that power. If I stay with that power, I'll repeat a performance. I'll run in fears. I'll do everything the same way I did before. Never knowing I could change, never knowing I could do, do differently. Step two is in the second position for exactly the question there. Because how could I make a decision to do anything if I stay with me? I can't. It's impossible. Well, again, the same thing. This is step four. There's defects of character that I use. The character I am is defective. I have things inside of me. So if you criticize me, I'm thin-skinned. I cannot take any kind of direction from anybody. All you have to do is say I'm doing wrong and I'll hit your guts. Uh, the defects of character that I have in me stops me from being someone different than I am. I can't be. I have to live by my rules, my standards, my thinking. And this I can't do. This is the disease when it's not treated. I can't change. I can't do any different. You ever see, you know, all alcoholics, but they don't treat their disease, are very thin-skinned. I don't know if you believe this or not. Just tell an alcoholic he's doing wrong. Try to correct him once. See what he does. See how quick you can get angry. See how quick he's got an answer back. Now, step four, it says, made a searching and fearless moral inventory is about my inventory of me, not nobody else, not a soul, only me. The only reason other people are in the picture is to identify the defect of character that I do to these people, my mother, my father, people that are close to me. That's the only thing. I'm only looking inside of me. I'm not looking outside of me in no way. Defects of character have to be established. They have to be identified. They have to be recognized. They have to be there in print. In print. Write them down. Or otherwise, what good are they? When my mind would let me think any way it wants to think. Would, would just take off and go any direction. When I wrote it down, is why step five is so hard to do. Is step five is when, when I have to accept the fact that I wrote about me. That's me I wrote about. Step four is always about me, how I treat the world, how I look at the world, how I treat people. Not about people. They haven't got nothing to do with it. It's the way I act and react to life and have, and that's all I can do. I can do no more. I'm already programmed. I've already got all of the anger in me. You don't have to put none in me. I got, I got everything that's needed. I don't need nobody or nothing to make my life unmanageable. I can make it unmanageable myself. All I have to do is just use my mind and it's an unmanageable life again. This It's given you an exil uh, illustration about how things are that you look at as they're wrong. They hurt your self-esteem. They, they're doing this to you. They're do they ain't doing that to you. You're looking for the defect of character that you produce from them people. That's what you're doing. This is something now you have to get out of the idea that other people are to blame. They're not to blame. This is not about other people, not a soul. This is only about yourself. The way you think and operate in your life and the day you live in, whether you're drunk or sober, makes no difference. The defects of character are called defects because there are things that are there that shouldn't be there. They're defective. 
If you've got some part here and it's defective, it's broken, you can't use it. Defects of character you can't use either because they're mind defects. They're a way of life. There's something now that will stop you and I from living in the world we live in because you cannot see it for what it is. That's explained on page 60 to 63. This is why it's important to remember these pages because of what, what they're there for. It says any life, I had to be convinced that any life run on self-will could hardly be a success. I'm always in conflict or, or fighting somebody or something, even when my motives are good. So defects of character, uh, to me, they're not hard. I don't think they're hard. I think five is harder. I can write down how I treated people. I'm not talking about people now. I'm talking about my behavior. What drove me? What made me do what I did? That's the thing I got to recognize. That's what I got to know. It's not in other people. Other pe people bring it out of me, but it's still in me. It's the way I am. That's all I got. I don't know what else to do. We better get on with the steps. <clears throat> you know, in step eight, each of these steps, like I said before, they're in an order form. One has to be there before the other. One has to follow the other so that it can do what it's supposed to do. And it talks in eight. It says, made a list of all persons we had hired and became willing to make amends to them all. The major thing about eight and nine, I don't think it's a long, long step in application, but I think certain things have to be clarified, have to be cleared up, have to be talked about, have to be identified. Because to make a list of all persons I had harmed would mean almost anybody that was in my life before Alcoholics Anonymous. Almost anything I did, almost every time, I was always in trouble. I always took advantage of people, hurt people, abused people, and so on. So this step here, it means this. Now, I said before, there's such a thing in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's clearing away the wreckage of the past. It's got to be that way. It has to be that way for the door to remain open so that you're not running scared, so you're not looking backwards, afraid of being found out, afraid of making a mistake, afraid of something catching up with you, and so on like that. That's one thing. There's another thing there, though, besides that. There is a, they, there is a way of living today so that the life that I live today in application is that I don't harm more people. So I don't start another list of my presence. And this has to be considered because, see, the character building isn't just to get away the wreckage of the past. The character building is building characters so I can live in the present. So my disease will be treated now. And this has, that's two things. That, that's not one thing. <clears throat> so to start, to start this off in step eight, is it talks here on page 80, it's talking here, <clears throat> we might next, next ask, ask ourselves what we mean when we say we harmed other people. What kind of harm do other people do another? Anyway, to define the word harm in a practical way, we might call it the result of instincts and collision which cause physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual damage to people. If our tempers are consistently bad, we arouse anger in others. If we lie or cheat, we deprive others not only of their worldly goods, but of their emotional security and peace of mind. We really issue an invitation to become contentious and vengeful. If our sex conduct is selfish, we may excite jealousy, misery, and a strong desire to retaliate in kind. Now, this is the part here that I had to learn is what follows this. Because I think all of us know just exactly what harm means when you harm other people, because there's many ways of harming people. But I never realized that this step is for the now as it is for clearing away the wreckage. And this is the now business is what this means plus the wreckage of the past. It says such gross misbehaviors is not by any means a full catalog of harms we do. Let us think of some of the subtler ones which can sometimes be quite as damaging. Suppose that in our family lives, we happen to be miserably irresponsible, callous, or cold. Suppose we, that we are irritable, critical, impatient, and humorless. Suppose we lavish attention upon one member of the family and neglect the others. What happens when we try to dominate the whole family, either by rule of iron or by constant outpouring of minute direction for just how their lives should be lived from hour to hour? What happens when we wallow in depression, self-pity, oozing for every poor, and inflict upon those about us? Such a roster of harms done others. The kind that make daily living with us as practicing alcoholics difficult and often unbearable could be extended almost indefinitely. When we take such personality traits as these in the shop, office, and the society of our fellows, 
They can do damage almost as extensive as what we have caused at home. The kind of harm is what they're talking about. I never considered about slighting you, not saying hello to you, not recognizing you, not acknowledging your presence, even here. To see somebody that's standing there as a stranger, and you don't even go over and say hello, and yet you were feeling from step seven, you had a feeling. I wonder if he's lonely. I wonder what. I wonder who he is. I wonder if she is, or something like that. Maybe I should say something. Maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't. I don't. Harm is in many, many ways, but the harm they're talking about here is more, I believe, in what I just read about how we we live this life by minute directions about how we try to boss, control people, how we, they've got to do this, they got to do that. This is important to know how I'll retaliate to you, whoever you are, how I won't recognize you, I won't identify you, I won't do anything, or maybe I'll even badmouth you from step six even. But see, this is all building a character so that I can live differently, do differently, and be differently. In step six, there's so much about six that was so was so 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 hard for me to realize to be entirely ready is from that moment on to be entirely ready to have God in my life forever. And now here we are, we're coming up to a step now, step eight. And it talks in here about suppose we lavish attention upon one member of the family. That could be your worker, a guy, somebody would you work with. It doesn't have to be a member of a family, it could be anybody. Maybe it's a secretary, maybe it's a gas station, maybe it's somebody. How you can favor people and show people, and other people, throw them away. They're worthless. They're nobody. This is starting to change so that the day I'm living in, I can have a new character. I can be the new character. I'm covering this here steps. is covering a lot of ground so that it'll fit all of us. But you can't read when it says something like this in here. Suppose it says... We lavish attention to one member of the family. How about the world? How about people? How about places you go? How about AA meetings? How about anywhere? See, the character has to be the character that can live anywhere. And we can be who we should be according to the will of God and this message here being the program recovery. So that we can walk in this day without this brain, this mind that keeps telling us how to act and behave. Because the, the harm that I cause people, it used to it, for me, it was very evident because how I favored people, how I would consider somebody real special, real special. And the next person alongside of them, I wouldn't give them two bits. I wouldn't give them any time. I wouldn't give them any answers. I wouldn't even look at them. And people get hurt that way. People get harmed that way. This step eight, uh, like I said, I don't think step eight is a big, long step, hard step to do. I don't think it's a step in relationship to the life I live in where I have to go in such great detail, where I have to stay in so many areas to learn so much. I don't think so. I never have. Because I never, as soon as I about this step at all. As far as making direct amends to such people wherever possible, I said I did it where I thought I should do it, and that's about as far as I went. I had a wife I took through the drinking days, and I beat her every way you could beat her. She was an asthmatic. She got asthma from my behavior, the way I lived, the way I went out of drunks and be gone some time, two, three days, and come home, and she'd be sick, and then put her in the hospital and so on. So there came a time, and I was sober, three and a half years, and I'll call it synonymous. Now, three and a half years, two and a half years, I didn't do nothing. Three, and then I started doing something in application. And I know steps, believe me, I do. But I never made amends. I never made direct amends to my wife. I made it to everybody else. I never once ever took it that I needed to do that. In three and a half years, I was sober. Three and a half years in Alcoholics Anonymous. She gets sick on a Thursday and she dies on a Sunday morning. I went to the hospital. She just died. There's no way that I ever could make direct amends to her. I suffered my life for a couple of years because of what I should have done and I didn't do. I considered everybody else but her. I thought the mere fact of staying sober I thought the mere fact of buying new cars, paying your bills, a house, clothes, buying things for it, doing things, I thought that was amends enough. And it never entered my mind that I should do something and I didn't do it. I, I, I just picked and choose. I thought it was okay to do this. To make direct amends, it was easy. to. I made direct amends to my father. I beat him up one time. 
I did. I actually beat him up. And I went and had to go back there. And I did drunk. And I had to go back there sober and talk to him and tell him exactly what, what, how I was living and what I was doing. And I told him. So, so I tried my, I tried my best <clears throat> at the time to make amends to the ones I thought I should do. The ones that I figured that the amends need to be made. There was a lot of people, or probably a lot of people, I can't remember of any, but maybe did need amends, but they weren't on no list that I had. And so this made me free of myself, except for the one thing. So you know what I talk to and I tell about a great deal? is that this day today, for you, if you're an alcoholic with alcoholism like me, if there's somebody that you love, you better give them the flowers today. Don't wait until they're in the cemetery like I did. Don't wait until you can't do anything about it. There's so many people that have treated me so special in my life ever since I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. This sponsor I had, he was a man of all men. You know what he did? <clears throat> he put me in this Alki hospital. I was broke. I lost my job. I was service manager, Lincoln Mercury dealer. I thought I was a big wheel. I didn't have a dime in my pocket. I went out on a drunk and I spent everything I had. I lost, the, I lost my job, my wife, and everything. He put me in a hospital and he paid my hospital bill. I couldn't pay it. I didn't have a dime. He got me my job back. He got me a job back at the same company on a different capacity. When I was, my wife was real sick. Three, three and a half months in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was sober three and a half months. And she was sick. And if I don't get her out of there, she's going to die. They told me, you've got, you've got to get going now. And I asked, I told Steve one day, my sponsor, Ed Stevens, he was a nice man. I told him, I said, you know what, Steve, I think I'll go down and ask Jim, the guy that owned the bar, the bar that got every paycheck I ever owned. And I said, I'm going to go down and ask Jim. I'm going to go down there and ask him if he couldn't give me some money, borrow some money, so I can go to California. And he said, no, you're not going to do that. You stay here. So he came back in a little while, and he gave me five $100 bills. Now, that was in March 1953. Believe me, $500 in 1953 was a lot of money. He gave me $500. He says, get going. He said, if you get it, give it back. If you don't, it's okay. The next day, I took off. I took off in my car, my tools, and what possessions I had in the little trailer, and my wife and I took off. Come to California. See, this here, <clears throat> this kind of life that I'm talking about is an ongoing life. It's happening now. There's so many good things to have in your life. But you must have, you must have a way in, a, in the day you're in. You must, have a, a, you must have some direction, some way. No matter how small, even the barest of beginnings, it says, is enough. To get it started, to have an open mind, to at least spend some time like you're spending today so that your life is important to you. This day to day for me, is important. It's very important because my life is here and I want all things that God says I can have. So why not wherever I'm at, whatever I'm doing, why not believe and trust in God? Why not try to put the principles in application for a way of life now? Why think in terms that maybe eventually I'll be all right or think in terms I don't need that? Yes, I do. Because if I don't have this, what have I got? I've got the same life I've always had. Years don't count. They never do. So this is important to put this in here and talk about this because it was step nine. It's from eight and nine. I don't believe eight and nine are that tough. I really don't. Once it's, once it's explained or once it's shown the character you are, you must live differently. You must be able to do differently so that this here, this is what I'm talking about, belongs to you like it belongs to me because every one of us know exactly how to behave the wrong way. We all know how to look at people, how to judge people, hurt people, criticize people, take advantage of people, push and shove all the time. But how to do this? It's in the steps. It's already being explained. Step nine, make direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Means that it takes me, I can't use nothing to hurt you and gain. Not only in the beginning of the application, but also today, this day. It's the same same principle, same same character going in this day to day, backed up now, always backed up by spiritual principles. 
That's what this step is. That's why I don't think it's that hard. But I think that eight is a little difficult, only in the word of harm, to recognize harm today and yesterday, and then in nine, to be willing today, this day, to make a list of all persons of harm, became the willing to make amends to them all, except when they injured them or others, but also how to live today so that I don't have to have another list, or how I have to go now and do things to correct things. The principles are always going in sobriety, going in being sober in application today. I'm building a character today. I'm building a character that has nine steps right till now in my life as a way of life today. Not when I'm going to do this, when I think I should do it or where I should think I do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to live it. I'm going to give it my best shot today. I'm going to do the best I can with what I got today. And that's all God wants out of me. So, you know, going into, go into uh, the steps there, I better go into 10. In, in 10, 10 is, uh, is another step that, uh, for application that has, has great meaning, has, has uh, very, very great meaning to it. It's continue to take personal inventory, and when I'm wrong, promptly admit it. Now, there's, it, this is going to cover a lot of ground. It's going to say a lot of words. Now, you know, let me tell you this while we're here, is that I know I've been talking a lot. I've been saying a lot of words. There's a lot of information been given out. And I, I know I know a mind, what a mind can do and what it can't do. And I know that a lot of this is just sailing over your head. I know it. I know a lot of it is it's just gets too, it gets too much. You know, it, it, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of everything. But believe me this. A certain amount of everything that's happened today, I'll guarantee you, a certain amount is registering in your subconscious mind. The subconscious. Not, not, not the conscious mind, not the subconscious mind, the unconscious mind. So try to remember that if you can, because you know, I tell you, this is along the same line in principle, that when I sometimes, I used to read this book here. Now way back, this book came out in 53. The 12 by 12 came out in 53. I bought the first new book of, of 12 by 12 in 53. And I've been reading it ever since. And I read it daily, practically almost every day. I study well. I know what I'm talking about for my life. But you see, this here is something that it grows. What I seen yesterday, I see more today. What I seen last year, I know much more than what I knew last year. You see, this is all about spiritual growth. So as I read, I grow spiritually. As I grow spiritually, there's more application in the day I'm in. <clears throat> this makes the world that I'm in a new world each day because I have more today than I had yesterday in application. See, I grow spiritually. In step 10, continue to take personal inventory. What's personal inventory? Well, I had to find out what step 10 is about. There's, there's a couple of things that are pretty big, I think, in step 10 is the part about promptly admitted it. See, that has to be established first because I kind of I got lost in that step too. Next, there's something else that has to be talked about, and it's on page 90 in your 12 by 12 here. And it talks in there about a spiritual axiom, that whenever something disturbs me, no matter what the cause, I'm at fault. Now, you see, that's a big, big, big sentence. It's a, it's a hard nut to swallow, but I had to learn to swallow it because it's true. And so this here step now, is a personal inventory. It starts out and talks in all inventories are alike in principle because we're going into ourselves to find out what's in ourselves. But it says it a little bit different. And it says it this way. It says, although all inventories are alike in principle, the time factor does distinguish one from another. There's the spot check inventory taken at any time of the day whenever we find ourselves getting tangled up. There's the one we take at the day's end when we review the happenings of the hours just past. Then it says this. It says, a spot check inventory taken in the midst of such storm, stormy or such disturbances can be a, ver a very great help in quieting stormy emotions. Today's spot check finds its chief application to situations which arise in each day's march. The consideration of long-standing difficulties had better be postponed, when possible, to times deliberately set aside for that purpose. 
The quick inventory is aimed at our daily ups and downs, especially those where people or new events throw us off balance and tempt us to make mistakes. See, I believe that you should look at this like I look at it in application so that as you start your day out, as each one of us start our day out, if something happens, something turns, something new, new events even, it says, or people, all of a sudden something happens and I start getting frustrated. I start getting angry. I start retaliating. I say something. I do something. And now I have to go through the rest of the day lugging that around with me, reliving that, rethinking that, re-experiencing that, that displeasure or comfort, discomfort. And it says, no, you don't have to. You can probably admit it. When you make a mistake or when something happens, you can be right then and there in connection with God so that you don't have to take it any farther. You can correct a thought, a deed, when it happens. Promptly admit it means promptly. Admit it to who? Doesn't mean to your neighbor or to your sponsor, and not to yourself, certainly. But it would mean promptly admit it to a power that can do something you can't do, a power greater than ourselves. It's already been established all the way along. As I'm building this character, I'm starting to depend more and more on God. I'm starting to use God everywhere I go. When before it was only down there, here and there, now and then. Now it's becoming a daily application. It says that. It's application. Applica I, I learned application out of the 12 by 12. I never learned. I never did know the word work, work steps. Work steps implies something. Maybe, uh, maybe it means my mind is thinking about it. So it's working. It, see? it does. I mean, that's the way my brain talks to me. So step 10. At step 10 on page 90, he says it's a spiritual axiom that every time we are disturbed, no matter what the cause, there is something wrong with us. If somebody hurts us and we are sore, we are in the wrong also. But are there no exceptions to this rule? What about justifiable anger? If somebody cheats us, aren't we entitled to be mad? Can't we properly, can, can't we properly, ang properly anger, angry with self-righteous folks? For us of the AA, these are dangerous exceptions. We found that justifiable anger ought to be left to those better qualified to handle it. Few people have been more victimized by resentments than we have, than we have, al uh, have we alcoholics. It mattered little, little whether our, our resentments were justified or not. A burst of temper could spoil a day. A well-nursed grudge could make us miserably ineffective. Nor were we ever skillful in separating justified from unjustified anger. As we saw it, our wrath was always justified. Anger, that occasional luxury of more balanced people, could keep us on an emotional jag indefinitely. These emotional dry benders often led straight to the bottle. Other kinds of disturbances, jealousy, envy, self-pity, hurt pride, did the same. See, the, the inventory that they're talking about, a personal inventory, would be more along the line of my thinking and acting in the day I'm in more than just going ahead and thinking in terms of an inventory of something gone by, done, already fixed in behavior, in thinking, in acting, and everything else. Because this year, with a personal inventory, would be more looking into self, as I talk to myself, as I live in the day I'm in, so that I can do something about this. Because when I do something about this, I don't have to go from that moment on with my brain being disturbed, angry, thinking about something, whether it was their fault, my fault, whose fault, so that I could walk in the day I'm in without the disease being walking with me. So that this means that step 10, if I make a mistake in the day I'm in, at any time of the day, early in the morning or late in the afternoon, it wouldn't make no difference. I can do something about it so I don't have to keep lugging around all of my troubles and tragedies and hurts and harms and memories and everything else. Because I told you before, for me, when I, the disease of alcoholism is on, it's on in its fullest. It's not only is that what's wrong that started the thing, but I happen to remember other things too. And it's really coming on real strong. It makes me think that I should act real strong back. And here it is, the disease now isn't just about one thing that just happened. It's a whole, whole mind that's with the disease. And here it comes, man, I'm, I'm, I'm reloaded for Freddy. I'm ready for Freddy all the time. 
And so to have this step here, the, the spiritual axiom, to recognize what a spiritual axiom is, it says few people have been more have been more victimized by resentments than we have we alcoholics. So it says it mattered little, little, little whether our our resentments were justified or not. I live in the world that I lived in. I lived in a world of resentments. I lived in a world of memory. I've got a mind like an elephant. I keep chalking things up. I keep remembering things. I harbor things. I keep things alive in my life. You do something and I'll never forgive you for it. Ten years later, I'll remember exactly how you acted, how you treated me, what you said, what you did to me. I'll never forgive you. And this is true. You see, the disease of alcoholism is a power. It's a, it's a mind. I said it before and it says it in print. It says it in the big book in this book here. And so this warped mind that I have is still warped when it's by itself. And here I am all the way up in step 10. And I'm looking at the same mind that's warped. It'll produce the same life. It'll do exactly the same thing. I've got proof upon proof right now through my own life in step application of what I'm saying. Because the day I'm in is the day I'll turn on you when the disease is not treated. Now, you would think after a period of time I ought to have an edge on that somehow. You'd think that after all these meetings this many years and this many prayers would make it so that I don't have to look at that again or it wouldn't happen again. Yes, it will. Because what happens is the same thing all the time. It's a power, and it's, it controls me. But it's me. It's my mind that's a power. And I don't know that this is a living thing. It's called alcoholism till the day I die. Whether I'm drunk or sober makes no damn difference. Step 10 allows me in the day I'm in to have so many things going for me that I never had before because of what I have to do. I have to keep taking a personal inventory of myself. That means there's a day I'm in. I can't look outside of myself. I can't find fault, blame anybody. I can't try to justify something. I make a mistake. I made a mistake. I'll apologize. I'll apologize to God. I'll ask God to forgive me, and I'll start doing whatever else is necessary. If I have to apologize to you, I will apologize to you. I've learned that I can take the blame for situations and events that I didn't do. It wasn't my fault. But by taking the blame... It makes you maybe a little bit better. Or maybe it helps the situation instead of it going more ratty. And what's the difference? This means that the life I have today is about my life today. How the world I live in is a good world. Because of the step application, the performance that I give is always here for me to give. It does not. It does not change. It does never get somewhere where I can't do it. You know, it, there's so many things to say here about this year, about the, you know, nursing grudges and all that kind of stuff. And it says in all, in, uh, in all these situations, we need self-restraint. Well, self-restraint is wanting this way of life. That means discipline. That means application. That means that you must trust again that your Heavenly Father will take care of you. That's what I had to do. I'm not telling you to do this. I'm telling you what I had to do, that I had to keep finding each and every day a relationship with a power greater than me, so I had a relationship away from self. This is an ongoing living life. This is something that I have to do for me today, this day, because I'm still always in the same predicament when I go to self. And I'm still always calling upon things that are not necessary. I'm calling upon doing things that I can't do. I'm calling upon me to act differently, and I can't do that. I just can't. I can start out, and I can mean well, but I can't do well. Personal inventory is actually looking at self in the day I'm in instead of waiting until the lid blows off or until I cause so much harm, until I go to bed at night, I can't sleep again, then start looking at it. No, I don't have to do that. I can have a direction in the day I'm in so that my life as I live it is a good life because I'm not stumbling. I'm not falling. I'm not trial and error. I don't keep hurting people and keep hurting people and hurting people again. I don't do that. I just don't. I can do things in a day I'm in only by the character that I am by the steps in, in the method of living. This is now. This is always now. I'm not trying to get ready for tomorrow. I don't even know what tomorrow will bring or even the next 10 minutes. I don't have to get ready for the next 10 minutes. I don't have to get ready to go into court, into a hospital, or any place like that. I don't need to do that. 
I'm still going to trust my Heavenly Father. He's going to take care of me wherever I go. And so what that means then, it means that peace of mind. It means that the rat race is over. It means the fears are gone. It means that I don't have to keep looking at doomsday. I don't have to expect the alcoholism side. I don't know, I'll make it. I'm going to die. I don't have to do that. This is all about what the step application does. This makes the character that I am. I can be this character today, now. And it's already proven what it is I have to be now. You know, this, this you know, some of this here I had a, a, a step 10. I might as well say something about it because uh, <clears throat> whenever something, the character I am, whenever somebody does something to me and I think that they, they've done too much to me, it, is that I can't forgive them. I have to, I have to keep, I have to keep real harmful thoughts. I have to keep thinking in terms of being hurt because they're so dumb and vicious and, and everything else like that. And so there came a time when I had to, I had to learn how to pray to for somebody else. And the reason I had to learn to pray for somebody else is that I had to figure out that to be relieved of the bondage of self, the only way I could do it would be able to think in terms that somebody else has got problems. Maybe somebody else is in a situation that they couldn't do anything different, even when they took all my stuff. Maybe maybe something there. You know, I'll never forget it. But what I'm saying is in here, it's about... It says, finally, we begin to see that all people, including ourselves, are to some extent emotionally ill, as well as frequently wrong. And then we approach true tolerance and see what real love for our fellows can actually mean. It will become more and more evident as we go forward that it is pointless to become angry or to get hurt by people who, like us, are suffering from the pains of growing up. Such a radical change in our outlook would take time, maybe a lot of time. Not many people can truthfully assert that they love everybody. Most of us will admit that we have loved but a few, that we have been quite indifferent to the many so long as none of them gave us trouble. And as, the, as for the remainder, well, we, we have really disliked or hated them Although, although these attitudes are common enough, we, yeah, yeah, it's fine that we need something much better in order to keep our balance. We can't stand it if we hate deeply. The idea that we can be possessive, possessively loving of a few, can ignore the many, and can continue to fear or hate anybody has to be abandoned, if only a little at a time. We can try to stop making unreasonable demands upon those we love. We can show kindness where we had shown none. With, the, with those we dislike, we can begin to practice justice and courtesy, perhaps going out of our way to understand and help them. Now, that fit me real good. That fit me so well that I had to do it, and I had to do it in a big hurry. And you know who told me to do it? One of my babies, one of the guys that I had helped, told me one day, he says, listen, you, he says, why don't you practice what you preach? And I said, God, I didn't even know it. I, honest to God, didn't know what I was doing. I, did, I, I was not aware of it. I thought I was justified. I thought that what had happened to me was so wrong that it could not be right in no sense of the word. And that's what this step is about. Personal inventory is about me. It's about the day I'm in. It's about the new character that God and I are trying to be together with. I'm trying to do his will. I'm trying to see that this life is mine too. I can have this life. No longer is it just in my sponsor or somebody else. So how do I get it? I get it the same way I've been talking about it. I must live today, this day, now, now, always now, with the program recovery and application. Then I can be that man. Because the way I live is the way it says I shall live. I live by principle, spiritual in their nature. I don't live it tomorrow. I live it today for my life today because my life is today. You know, step 11, the step 11 is, is a step. Hey, you know what we ought to do? Uh, do we have a coffee break or do we or not? Yeah, let's take it before we go. We got four o'clock. We got an hour to go. And then we'll, done, we'll be done. One more hour. So we're... We got, we're running short on time. We're trying to get as much as we can get in here now. And so we'll go to step 11. In step 11, it says, sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God as I understood him, praying only for the knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. 
Now, there's a, there's a, this, is a, this is another step. Man, this is a big step, too. This is one of the steps that uh, it's endless. It's never-ending story. It just keeps going on and on. But first, I'll say some things about it in principle. So you, the, the, we, the reason for this step, it's the only step that, as far as I'm concerned, what I know, it's the only step I can grow spiritually. Now, remember this. This is a principle. This is important, what I'm saying. This is very, very important. It's the only step that I can grow spiritually in the day I'm in. There's the only one step, and that's step 11. For what it says, it says, sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God as I understood him. Understood him is going way back down to two. When three says God as I understood him, 11 says God as I understood him, and it's underlined the same way, meaning the same thing. So you see, sought is a word that I had to find out too. Sought isn't seeking. Sought is something that's continuous, goes on forever. Seeking is until I find something, and then I don't have to seek it no more. So sought through prayer and meditation is something I must do in the day I'm in. So it's a conscious contact. So that means when do I seek God or sought God or do God? When do I do this? It says, sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God. That must mean now. That must mean right now. It doesn't mean tonight when I go to bed. It doesn't mean in the morning. It can't mean that. Because it says to improve my conscious contact. How can I improve my conscious contact with God if I'm not with God? How can I do that? I can't do it. This step now is the only step I said that I believe you can grow spiritually on because of consciously doing something each and every day with the power which is called God to improve my relationship with this God. Then when it says, sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God as I understood him, it's understood from two that that's a power they call God. It's greater than me. And it says, praying only for the knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. See, that there is another statement that means it has to be looked at for what it is. Praying only for the knowledge. Praying for the knowledge. You see, this is the, this is the, the, the back down in two, the relationship I had to build. Three says, now you can do something because all you'll have to do now is make the decision, leave the decision there, and that's where your will and your life lies. And so Levin says now that I can go farther from my foundation. I can go into the world I'm in now, growing spiritually. Step Levin's the only step I believe myself, because the other steps don't, I don't grow spiritually. Step Levin says I do grow spiritually because this here, this business, praying only for the knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out. Now that there is a is an ongoing character building, character living, character application in today's life. This day, today. A long time ago, you see, it was all, everything I did, it, it was something that I have done. It's something that I have done, and I don't have to worry about it. I don't even have to think about it. I think in terms of 12 steps now, it's being something I did. And then I go ahead and live my life as I live my life. And it's not that at all. In step 11, it's a guarantee for me, again, that this day, now, my disease can be treated. Praying for the knowledge of his will for me, down in three. I had to learn in three when it talks in there about only me in the light of my own circumstances can exert this willingness. Trying to do that is an act of my own will. The correct use of my will is in alignment with God's will. There's only one will. There's no such thing as wanting to know or to see, to hear, to think in terms of wonder what my will is or wonder what God's will is. There's no such thing as that. It can't be because it's established in the steps that there is one will. And the correct use of my will is in alignment with that will. That will meaning God. And then in 11, when it's talking, praying only for the knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. And so that means exactly that each and every one of us can have in our lives as alcoholics in application the power from God, his will, sought through prayer and meditation to improve something that I'm doing. I can grow spiritually. I can have more. I can read more and benefit more from the reading I do today because of what Step 11 says. And that means exactly that. I don't just have to pray and meditate. The conscious contact is there. The conscious contact is always there. Instead of practicing my presence, I'm practicing God's presence. So Step 11 
is a, is a step that I that maybe we have to talk about, or maybe that uh, questions we get some of them answered, is about the day the day we're in. Just where is God's will? Just how do I use God's will? What does it mean so that I can have conscious contact with God? When is conscious contact with God? Is it just sitting here and thinking a thought of God or something like that? When is conscious contact? And this here, praying now for the knowledge of his will. You see, I pray to God, and I ask God to be with me today, with all of us today, to be able to do his will, to be powered by his strength, his guidance, his words, each and every one of us in this room. This is an ongoing living life that I'm talking about that I have to do for me. It includes you too. But you see, the important part about this is I'm praying for the knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. And to carry that out is the life that each and every one of us want to know. Just exactly, how much of a life do you have today in Alcoholics Anonymous? What is this life doing for you? Where is this life coming from? Is it coming from you yet? Or who are you giving credit to? Are you taking some of the credit yourself? You see, we went through all of this down in steps. That was in the humility and humbleness in step seven. See, I had to learn the building the character. There's a lot of principles that I have in me today that I know how to use today for my life today. And they're already, they're already founded right here. They're already based. And it's in print. And it's the same for me as it is for you. Because this is a way of life. This is a method of living that will guarantee each and every one of us the disease, meaning the mind, meaning the yesterdays, meaning all of the defects, meaning all of the shortcomings, now are not there. They're not. Because I'm performing differently today. I have something going for me now that I never really realized that for a long time just exactly how powerful, just how deep, just how far this program recovery can take you. When before it was surface stuff all the time, it was I never thought in terms that it could be in all of my affairs, no matter where I'm at, for what time, or what length of time, or anything else, or whatever I do. I never knew that I can go farther in the day I'm in, in character, application. I can I don't have to even get ready for the next two minutes. I don't have to. I don't have to anticipate things to say or do because something hard is coming up, some kind of adversary, some kind of trouble, some kind of a money problem, sleeping problem, whatever it is. doesn't make no difference. I don't have to have that mind that I used to have. Step 11, growing spiritually, is exactly what 11 all about. In sought is a word that must be, I believe this must be looked at, that's a word I never used in my vocabulary. I don't know if you did. I never have. I never used the word sought. I never even knew what the sought meant. I know what seeking means, and I, but I don't know how to use the word in my life sought. I don't. But to do something and then to continually do it and not stop. Sought through prayer and meditation. Keep praying. Keep meditating. Meditating is no more than going inwardly with God. Prayer is going outwardly, always reaching out. Always going to God. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact so that I'm doing something now I never knew I could do before. I never knew that I could have a living God in my life today, no matter where I'm at. I don't care. And you should hear some of the questions I hear at stag meetings when somebody will say, well, how do you have God here? Or where's God there? And stuff like that. And you can imagine what they're saying. And yet God can be there too because the character that I am is the character that God says I can be, and wherever I am, that character is there too. And so, leaven, leaven is to me is a beautiful step. It really is because of what I have to do. I have to do something daily, and it's a living life today through prayer and meditation to improve something that's already helping me so tremendously and so good to me at all the time, and yet it can get better. I told you before that I used to see days come and go that I thought that no day could ever top this day because of what happened that day. And yet, though, you know what? Another day comes along, and it gets better. Something better happens. More is being showed me. Why? How come? Just out of the blue by itself? No way. The way it happens is exactly the way it always happens in my life. The new character, the character that I am, is qualified to go in the world and see a world in there because I can give to the world. I can add something. I can I can be somebody that when I do something, the world turns nicer. I get more. And things come to me that I don't even know where they come from. I don't know how they even happen, but they happen. 
So what is all of that? That certainly isn't fantasy land. It's a real life. It happens all the time. It's taken me around the road in areas and places that, man, I'll tell you, I've been in some serious trouble. But it never once had to be so that I had to lose my life over it. I never had to hurt people because of it. I never got hurt either. And this is a guarantee for each one of us of this application of these steps. So the character building is still going on right now. And this means exactly that for me. And if you're an alcoholic like I am, then you're going to have to do something. And this is exactly what this workshop's all about. What we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll, go, we'll go into step 12. And then we, or we, we better go into step 12. And then we can go to questions and we can finish it out in the questions, okay? Uh, because time goes so quick, it's, it's running now, what, about 20 after or so. And maybe we can go another 10 minutes or something like that. And 12, 12 is, is uh, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, I tried to carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all of my affairs. And so this means this. It says, the way it's worded, it, they're talking, step 12 is talking about the other 11 steps. It says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, that's the other 11 steps, that I tried to carry this message, this message, what message? The message that's in the print, the message that's in the steps. It isn't my message. I don't have a message. I know you don't either, because you wouldn't be here either if you did, because you wouldn't have the troubles you have. So what is this message? This message is exactly what I said. It's in print. There isn't a thing that I said to you this, and I won't back it up by what's in print. I'll show you exactly where it's at, what it says. And so you see, this is a message. It's a message of recovery. It's a program of recovery, a method of living, a way of life that is already established. It's already there. It's in its entirety. It's nothing, in, you can't add nothing to this, take anything away from it to make it any better, any quicker, any stronger, anything. This is, a, again, a recognition, identifying, the program recovery. The program recovery is 12 steps. That's the message. If there's no steps, there's no message. Because I know for sure this meeting is not going not to treat your alcoholism. I know it isn't. Now, that's my opinion. But it's my opinion because of what happened to me. I know darn well that reading does not treat alcoholism. It doesn't. Because I've done that too. I studied, I studied, I studied. I lost... Many, many, many hours, many hours of no sleep studying. And I remained the same. I thought the same, drove the car the same, treated my wife the same, everything the same. I stayed sober. So the name of the game for me is looking at this world. You know, that one of the things I hear say in AA, and I hear it said years ago, and I hear it today, is that when somebody talks, anybody, any alcoholic, and they describe something that's adversity or troubles of some kind, and then the bottom line is, through it all, I stayed sober. No matter how they acted, what they did, they stayed sober. Now, to me, that's the way I used to live in AA. I thought that in AA. That can't be right. That cannot be right. How could that be right? When I can hurt people, turn around like a rattlesnake, and then claim that through it all, I'm going to stay sober. There's no problem. Yes, there is a big problem. If I keep it up, you know what's going to happen? I'm either going to put the brain, put a bullet in my brain or I'm going to get drunk or wind up strapped down again in the hospital somewhere. This here, I have to, I know, I know for me, I believe everything I'm talking about. I believe it. I know it because it's my life. It's been my life. And I came here for me a long time ago and I'm still here for me. But you see this here, what I'm talking about now in step 12, step 12 is a summation. And what is saying in there? is something that's already happened. I've already had a spiritual awakening. A spiritual awakening doesn't happen one time for one thing. That's not a spiritual part of it. But a spiritual awakening is the recognition, the identification of the grace of God on me daily. The spiritual awakening is a mind now that Step 11 says that I can have this. I can grow spiritually. I can have a world now that he says I can have, that my God says I can have. Praying only for the knowledge of his will for me and a power to carry that out. Step 12 then immediately says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, I try to carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all my affairs. What principles? 
principles, like I said in the beginning, they're truth. They're truth. And it talks in, a, in, in your dictionary. If you look it up, I looked it up many times, different dictionaries even. So we'll look up the word principle. And it says it's, essential, it's an essential truth where all truths are based from. There's an origin. There's a start of us somewhere. That's a guarantee. It won't let you down. It won't fail. It'll always be there consistently, constantly. It'll always give you the same result. And this is important to know because principles, I don't know the word principle. And it says practice these principles in all of my affairs. Why doesn't it say practice these steps in all of my affairs? You see, it's more about steps. It's a much, much, much bigger world than steps could ever be because it's a spiritual world. It's spiritual food. It's spiritual growth. It's spiritual application. No matter where I go, no what, no, I don't care where I, what, are, what, what I do, where I go. There's always a power with me, a power greater than me, that makes it possible to go there, wherever there is, and do whatever I do, and be right, right with the world, to contribute to the world, to look at the world, to look at the world like I could never look at it before. Sure, you know darn well I don't walk on water. You know I've had troubles. You know that I had so many things happen to me too. But that's no excuse. That's no excuse at all to say I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have. It shouldn't have happened to me. Yes, it should, because my heavenly Father still took care of me, and I'm still here right now. I've been here a long, long time, but a long, long time doesn't guarantee nothing no more than today's application. This is true. Every one of every word I say is true. To live in a world thinking that you're you're missing the mark, you're a loser, thinking that you're not worth anything, thinking that your failure is going to get it again, to think these thoughts and to produce that life from these thoughts, I don't want to do that no more, is not necessary. My Heavenly Father guarantees me all the time that all I'll have to do is allow Him to be in my life. He'll take care of me. This is the total dependence. This is the this is the dependence that I must learn way, way down in steps when it was first introduced in step three. This is this is what it meant is when I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to care of God as I understood them forever. Do you see? Every one of these steps I've been talking about, they're not to fix problems. Problems can't be fixed. It's impossible. None of us can fix problems. If you don't think so, get rid of a problem. You know what follows it? Take a look and see what follows it. What do you think follows one problem? Here comes another problem right behind it. That's the way we live. We're problem people. It says so in step 12. Step 12 says exactly the same thing that I'm saying right now. It says, these little studies of A's 12 steps now come to a close. We have been considering so many problems that it may appear that A consists mainly of racking dilemma and troubleshooting. To a certain extent, that is true. We have been talking about problems because we are problem people who have found a way up and out and who wish to share our knowledge of that way with all who can use it. For it is only by accepting and solving our problems that we can begin to get right with ourselves and with the world about us, and with him who presides over us all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.